I entered the classroom and 32 pairs of eyes turned to stare at me. My heart picked up its pace as the teacher joined the class to look, making it 33 pairs of eyeballs on me. I've always been good with numbers. My mom says it's a gift. I didn't even need to count. Can I help you? The teacher wasn't comprehending the situation. Here I was, a strange kid standing at the front of his class, sweating, backpack in hand, looking nervous as hell. Wasn't it obvious? Did I really need to spell it out for him? Was the first day of high school this hard for everybody? Or just me? I'm new here. It's my first day, I said. The anthem of the uninitiated. The one line to get you out of any embarrassing situation. Or so I thought. Mr. Payne wasn't familiar with this edict. Either that or he'd forgotten his hearing aids. It's halfway through the semester and I've never seen your face before. You can't just march in here and expect me to let that fly. What's your excuse for playing hooky, mister? No one said a word. They all just stared, basking in the cringe. The silence was interminable. The anxiety was excruciating. I felt like I was having a nightmare. Next, I would for sure look down to see I was naked on top of everything else. Uh, I was living on the other side of the country. We just moved into our house on Saturday. That was for sure a good enough reason to have missed in-class sessions. He glowered at me with his arms crossed. Uh... My name's Jake Watson. I just moved here from out of town. Didn't the principal... You'll find excuses don't carry much weight with me, Mr. Watson. Find a seat. He said, his tone indicating that I would be getting C's or worse for the rest of the year, regardless of my efforts. There was only one empty seat available next to a kid with thick glasses and an Iron Maiden t-shirt. He was short, pale, gaunt looking slightly unwell. Some people just look that way, I guess. Hey, he said from across the narrow aisle. I'm Chris. Don't mind Mr. Payne. That's where he got his name. He's a pain in all of our asses. I snickered, happy that someone was being decent to me after my floundering entrance. Thanks, I'm Jake. Mr. Payne then yelled at us to pipe down, and we sat listening silently to his monotone math lecture until the end of the period. It was easily the most boring hour of my life, and I had no idea how I was going to make it through an entire semester of that torture. Eventually it was over, though, and the bell ringing to indicate the end of first period. Welcome to Havenworth High, Chris said as we got our books together and fled the class. Don't worry. I'll show you the ropes. Okay, thanks. I don't really know anybody here yet. I said goodbye to Chris as we went our separate ways to f different classes. He said he had to go to history while I was going to science with Mr. Stroob. Ah, oh, Stroob's alright. We've got him third period. It's better than Payne, at least. But then again, who isn't? Of course, Mr. Payne happened to walk by at that exact moment and gave us both a withering glare, which said he would remember this, and we would regret the day we were ever born. I didn't see Chris again until lunch, when I was standing in line in the cafeteria. The options for the day were french fries, mini pizzas, or you could choose from an array of two-week-old tuna fish sandwiches. I opted for the mini pizza while Chris loaded his tray with the works. French fries two mini pizzas, three bags of chips, chocolate milk, and a cupcake for good measure. Never eat the tuna fish, he said ominously as we made our way to an open table. The two of us sat down. Chris opened his chocolate milk and began to guzzle it in one long swig, then made a loud ah, sound before burping and pitching the carton over a group of kids into a nearby trash can. 
they didn't even notice. LeBron, over six defenders, three-pointer, it's good! Then he started on his mini pizzas, and they were gone before I'd even started eating. I couldn't understand how someone who eats like that could be so thin. You don't talk much, huh? He asked around a mouthful of fries and ketchup. I tried to speak, but he cut me off before I could. That's okay. I'm a bit of a motor mouth myself, at least that's what my mom says. I talk enough for ten people, according to her, and eat enough for ten more on top of that. I've got a high metabolism. Oh, yeah? I, I didn't notice. I guess you want to know the lay of the land around here, huh? Well, that's all right. I'll give it to you straight. See, you and me, we're lone wolves. There's a bunch of outliers like us who don't conform to the hierarchical structure, you know? Like Jasper over there. He pointed to a red-haired kid with headphones on, wearing thick glasses and rainbow suspenders, sitting at another table. The kid had a heap of electronics in front of him, his lunch sitting to the side, cold and ignored. Cables were running from his makeshift array of antennas and metal boxes with switches and blinking lights on them. We stared at him for a few seconds, but he, he didn't seem to notice. See, Jasper's an outlier, through and through. But then there's all your typical archetypes and predictable cliques. From the top of the food chain down, you got your jocks and cheerleaders. He pointed over in the direction of one section where 26 boys in letterman jackets were eating a rowdy lunch. Twelve cheerleaders were in close proximity, exactly four of them talking with the boys. Two of the guys were shoving a smaller boy with braces against the wall, taking his lunch money with apparent immunity and tossing a football back and forth intermittently. Absolute top of the ecosystem alpha bullies right there, and their Genghis Khan-adjacent leader, Chet Munster. This time he didn't dare point, but he didn't need to. I saw the tall, blonde-haired jock with broad shoulders and his arm wrapped around the prettiest cheerleader I'd ever seen and knew it was him without asking. His girlfriend, Rachel... She's head of the cheerleading squad, obviously. Drop dead gorgeous, even more obviously. Don't stare, and don't get on Chet's bad side, or you'll be in real trouble. I won't be able to help you. Okay, that's good to know. Then, moving down the ladder, you got your skater kids. They're pretty cool. Their music is decent, unlike the jocks. But the prerequisite of being part of that group is you need to know how to skateboard. Hence, I'm out since I have crippling vertigo and self-diagnosed avian bone syndrome. He indicated another group of eight kids who were heading out the back door of the cafeteria, kick-flipping on skateboards and looking way too cool for me to ever hang out with. Hmm. Skater kids, huh? Uh, They don't look as scary as the jocks, at least, I said hesitantly, waiting for him to interrupt me again. Wait, did you say avian bone syndrome? Yeah, that's right. Anyways... You got your emo goth kids. I gotta be honest, I don't know a whole lot about them. They like to stick to themselves for the most part. They hang in the art room most of the time after lunch, brooding in the darkness and glazing pottery. See, there they go. He averted his eyes, and I watched with my peripherals as a group of ten pale-looking kids dressed in black clothing shuffled out of the cafeteria. A few had facial piercings and black nail polish, and they were all silent, none of them speaking a word. I had a strange feeling running down my spine as a couple of them glanced in our direction momentarily, then looked away. An odor followed them. Unpleasant and sour, but familiar somehow. I tried to place that smell, but couldn't. Those guys freak me out. Seems like that group gets bigger every day. But who's counting? Anyways... Moving on down the social hierarchy, you got your stoners. Now, you won't see most of them most of the time, especially during lunch hour. They like to hang out behind the water tower. After lunch, I had art class, and Chris had science with Mr. Strube. Luckily, for the fourth period, we both had the same class again. Civics with Mr. Bain. Only one of us wouldn't make it there that day. I left my new friend as we parted ways, thanking him for telling me about the social hierarchy at Havenworth High School. (laughs) Social hierarchy. More like a frickin' food chain. 
Havenworth High is a jungle, man. Don't forget it. And be careful in art class, he said, chuckling. Remember, that's where the emo kids like to hang out. Don't fall in with that crowd or you won't be an outlier anymore. Lone wolves forever, man. You and me, ride or die, you feel? I laughed and we shook on it, making up what would become our patented secret handshake on the fly right then and there. It was like we'd known each other in another life, I realized, as we'd become such fast friends. The handshake was complex, but not overly so. Just strange enough to be original, but not over the top. Wow, nice one. Didn't plan that or anything, see? Same wavelength, you and me. Smiling, I left Chris and went to art class. After so much uncertainty moving to a new city and a new area on the other side of the country, it was a relief to have made a friend so quickly. I didn't realize it at the time, but everything would begin to go quickly sour after that. But at least I had one good morning at Havenworth High before things started to get really terrible. It was all because I was worried about being late for art class. So I went there 15 minutes early. And then I didn't want to just stand outside the door, so I went in. It was still lunch hour, and I found the classroom to be empty. But there was a noise coming from the small room off to the side. It was a wet, sloppy sound, like a group of a dozen people eating barbecue ribs with their mouths open. Meat being pulled from bone, dripping juices, and tearing gristle. For some reason, despite my apprehension, I was drawn towards those sounds. And I found myself holding my breath as I stepped deeper into the classroom. A wooden door was standing about ten feet away, slightly ajar, and the sounds were coming from just inside that room. As I got closer to the door, my heartbeat started speeding up. The lub-dub sound of it was loud in my ears. And just as I pushed the door open wider, the noises stopped completely. I froze, realizing that whoever was making those wet chewing sounds had heard the loud squeak of the door opening. Can I help you? A man's voice said from behind me, and I spun around, my heart now galloping in my chest. A teacher was standing there, his hands on his hips, looking angry. He had a goatee and short red hair. Sorry, I'm I'm a few minutes early for class. I I, I thought I heard something in there, and I um, I'm Jake Watson. It's my first day. I stuck out my hand for him to shake, but he didn't take it. Instead, he folded his arms across his chest and shook his head. I'm going to need to ask you to leave. Art club meeting is a private affair. We're having a wee barbecue for lunch, and these things get very messy. Sure. That makes sense. It didn't. It didn't smell like barbecue, either. It smelled like blood. Coppery and so specific that it really couldn't be mistaken for anything else. Sorry, I'll go. Uh, No problem. I faked as if I was going to leave, and then the sounds resumed behind the door just as the teacher turned around to show me out. I quickly doubled back and ducked my head inside the room, unable to resist my curiosity. And what I saw when I looked inside the room... Well, it made no sense. This was supposed to be a high school, not a George Romero film. The room was lined with clear plastic tarps, which covered the walls, floor, and ceiling. And the goth kids I'd seen in the cafeteria were all on their hands and knees surrounding the gasping, blood-soaked body of some poor kid in a letterman jacket. I couldn't tell who it was. His throat had been torn out and his face was shredded. His guts were hanging out. His chest and belly opened up like a cadaver on an autopsy table. The goth kids were feasting on him like a pack of hyenas, their faces red and covered with blood. I backed out slowly and spun around. Luckily, the teacher didn't see me, or who knows what he would have done. 
It was obvious he was protecting them. Quickly I heard out of the art classroom as the teacher showed me out, holding the door open for me. Welcome to Havenworth High, Jake. I'm Mr. Mulholland. I'll see you very soon in class. Just don't be so early next time. Unless you wanted to join the art club. That could certainly be arranged. We get so many new members these days. You'd be amazed to see how fast the group is growing. I backed away, feeling ill, feeling dizzy and queasy and floaty like I was just dreaming. Uh, thanks, Mr. Mulholland. I will think about that. I really will. He frowned, looking down at me. Why do you look so nervous all of a sudden? Uh, no reason. I'm always nervous. It's my first day. I have to go. Uh, home. I'm not feeling well all of a sudden. Okay, gotta go. Bye. I began to run. Without stopping at my locker for my homework, I bolted straight home, where I immediately puked my guts out. At least that helped convince my dad I wasn't faking. He runs a computer repair business out of our basement, so he was surprised to see me back home so soon in the middle of the day. Despite what I'd seen, I found that I couldn't bring myself to tell him. There was no way that he would believe me, I thought. A bunch of zombie, cannibal, goth kids using art club as a cover for killing students and eating them. I mean, I hardly believed it, and I had seen it with my own eyes. The more I thought about it, the more it felt like a bad dream. A nightmare that never could have happened. But it did happen. And tomorrow I've got to go back to school. I have to face Mr. Mulholland and the goth kids again, and I have to figure out what to do about everything I witnessed. Maybe Chris can help. If we're going to stop them, we need to find proof. And we need to find it fast. Psst. I heard someone whisper from beside me. Wake up. Pain's going to notice. I paid them no mind. I was far too busy watching the scene unfolding in front of me. A dozen kids dressed in black clothing with dark painted hair and nails. They were all sitting around a table in the cafeteria of my new school, passing around plates of red, sauce-covered food. As I looked closer, I realized they were sharing bowls of small intestine, not spaghetti as I'd first thought. There were human brains and a heart arranged tastefully on a serving platter, with sprigs of parsley and lemon wedges added for color. Trays of what at first looked like stir-fry turned out to be strips of skin and other indeterminate organs. The group of goth kids were eating with their bare hands. Their mouths bloodied as they tore off hunks of flesh and gobbled them down greedily, slurping intestines like pho noodles. Then they all turned in unison to look at me. Eat up, Jake. Aren't you hungry? They asked in one voice that sounded like my mother at the breakfast table that morning. I glanced down at one plate and saw a familiar face. The decapitated head of Mr. Payne, my math teacher. He looked angry and was shouting at me to... Wake up! Abruptly, I opened my eyes and began screaming. A long string of warm drool stretching from my arms where I had laid my head up to my lips. The entire math class burst into laughter and I felt my face getting hot with embarrassment as I looked around to see them all staring at me. All 32 of them. 33 if you can't Mr. Payne. I wiped away the large puddle of drool with the dry part of my sleeve. That had been the most high-pitched scream I'd ever made or heard made by a human being. It was closer to the sound of a kettle boiling over. Are you alright, Mr. Watson? Do I need to send you back to the principal's office again? I had already been there once that morning, since I'd missed half my classes the day prior. 
I was told I'd been assigned mandatory after-school detention. It didn't seem to matter that I'd been sick, puking my guts out after seeing the art club goth kids eating one of the jocks while he was still alive like a bunch of zombies. Of course, I didn't tell the principal that last part. I was positive he wouldn't believe it. In fact, I hadn't told anyone in real life yet. I was going to try to fill Chris in during break, though. No, Mr. Payne. I'm sorry. It won't happen again. See that it doesn't, he said, turning around and going back to the chalkboard where he scribbled some more indiscernible equations. I had no problem with the material in the textbook. Mr. Payne's chicken-scratch handwriting was the issue I was beginning to realize. It looked like weather-damaged hieroglyphs. Psst. I need to talk to you about something after class. I whispered to Chris. It's important. If it's important, then save it for lunch. My second class is on the other side of the school. Sorry, man, it takes the whole break to get over there. Mr. Payne looked at us sharply, and I zipped my lips for the remainder of the hour. Worried what would happen if he had to reprimand me again. After an exhausting couple of hours, it was finally time for lunch break. I entered the cafeteria to the loud cacophony of several hundred voices talking over each other all at once. Joining the shuffling lineup, I grabbed a tray, and a second later, Chris was behind me. Hey, no cuts! Someone yelled, but he pretended not to hear. All right, what's so important, Jake? You said you needed to tell me something? Not here. Let's grab our food and talk somewhere private. After we'd loaded up our lunch trays, we found an open table and sat down near the wall. Chris once again had enough to feed a family of four, but he made it disappear quickly. Before I'd even started eating, he was belching loudly and raising his eyebrows, a toothpick in his mouth. The plates in front of him were empty, and he was looking at my tray, coveting the french fries I'd purchased. So? You gonna spill it already? I'd been trying to figure out what to say. How to explain to him that the school had a potential zombie problem. I wasn't even sure if that was what they really were. But eventually I settled on just telling it to him straight. From the top. Okay, remember yesterday after lunch? I went to art class 15 minutes early, right? Just to get settled in? (laughs) Yeah, sure. If that's what you wanted to call it. Wasting your lunch hour is what I call it, though. Don't tell me you're going to do that every day. You're going to look like such a nerd. Uh, That's not what's important, okay? Look, I went in there and the class was empty, but then I heard this sound coming from the, the room ahead to the right. Yeah, the kiln room. That's where all those goth kids like to hang out. Probably inhaling pottery fumes or getting high or something. That's what I think, anyways. No, it's not that. It's something way, way worse. I looked around to see if anybody was listening. The goth kids were on the far side of the cafeteria. But when I glanced in their direction, I saw they were moving towards us suddenly. As if they could hear what I was saying. Shit. They're headed over here right now. Who? Oh, them. So what? It's not like it's Chet Munster. What the hell? Chris's eyes widened and I looked to see... Chet Munster captain of the football team and certified jock, was with the goth kids now. And he was no longer wearing his letterman jacket. Instead, he had facial piercings, mascara, nails, and lipstick, all black, and was wearing a Rob Zombie shirt. He had also dyed his hair black and was much paler than I remembered him being the day prior. I glanced at his torso to see if there were any signs of the damage done yesterday, Realizing now that it was him, I had seen the zombie kids attacking. But they hadn't killed him. They'd made him... into one of them. What in the hell is Chet Munster doing with the goth kids? Has the whole world gone topsy-turvy? Are we in the bizarro universe? Chet's girlfriend, Rachel, went over to him and tried to intercept him as the group of goths crossed the cafeteria, moving toward us purposefully. His eyes were locked onto us both. What happened to you yesterday? You ditched me. 
What are you doing, Chet? Why are you hanging out with them all of a sudden? He just pushed her aside as if he didn't care for her in the least, and I realized she wasn't going to stop him. Uh, we need to go. Right now. I'll explain when we're away from them. Chris objected momentarily, but then he saw the look on my face and conceded. Okay, but I'm bringing your french fries. The two of us ran out of the cafeteria and ducked into a stairwell, racing up to the second floor. There were plenty of places to hide in the school, and we had a head start, but Chet was quick. I thought I could hear him chasing after us, not far behind as we turned each corner. I didn't look back, too terrified of what I might see. In here, Chris said, pointing at a bathroom. We went inside and hid in the stalls, thinking stupidly that somehow we were invincible in the bathroom, as if some code of honor protected us here. But at least it was empty, so I could finish my story. Look, this is going to sound nuts, but you have to believe me. The goth kids were eating somebody in that kiln room, Chris. They had some kid in a letterman jacket cut wide open like he was on an autopsy table. And they were eating his guts like a buffet. I think it was Chet. I think they're zombies, and they turned him into one of them. Since we were in different toilet stalls, I couldn't see how Chris reacted. I imagined the worst immediately. Him screwing up his face in disgust and disbelief. Look, I know how that sounds. Trust me, I do. But it's true. Look, just look at the evidence. Chet Munster, quarterback and captain of the football team, joins the goth group? Ditches his hot girlfriend? Look, you must know there's something going on here. you got to believe me. It was quiet in the bathroom for a few long moments, and I wondered if maybe he'd left, but then he cleared his throat as if to speak. Before he could say a word, the door crashed open. The sound was loud as if someone had kicked it hard and had smashed against the wall. There was a sound of footsteps coming closer. A fist banged against the hand dryer, causing the air to blow noisily. To cover up the sound of what was about to happen, I wondered to myself if we were going to be turned into one of them. The first stall door was kicked open and crashed against the wall with a loud bang. Then the next stall flew open with an even louder crash. Closer now. It was Chet. I knew without having to look. It was like I could smell him. Only two stalls were left, Chris's and mine. We were both waiting for them to be kicked open when a bunch of boys walked in laughing and talking to each other. Yo, what up Chet? Sweet Rob Zombie shirt. A teenage boy said sarcastically, then started a cappella singing the guitar and lyrics to Immigrant Song. Chet grunted something and I heard him shuffle out of the room. The kid continued singing sarcastically after him as he went. What's up with him? Dude's losing it. Man, if Rachel dumps his ass, I'm totally making a move. She's hot as hell. <laughs> yeah, right, like she'd go out with you. The stall opened up next to mine, and I realized Chris was leaving without me. He washed his hands for show, and I got out of the stall, and I was going to go follow after him. Immigrant song is Led Zeppelin, not Rob Zombie, Chris said to the a cappella singer on the way out, matter-of-factly. Yo, what the hell did you say to me? One of the guys called after him, but he ignored them. At least Chet wasn't in the hallway when I got out there, but Chris looked like he wanted nothing to do with me. Listen, I know how all of this sounds, okay, but I can prove it. They're using that kiln room as a kill room. If we go down there and look, you'll see. It's, it's all wrapped in plastic like a scene out of American Psycho. Chris didn't look impressed. He clearly thought I was making all of this up. Did you, like, forget to take your meds or something, man? Because if you got some mental health stuff going on, that's, that's okay with me. I'm still down to be friends. But you gotta be straight up with me about it. Now just tell me, are you hearing voices? Do you need to see somebody? No, I'm not crazy. See, this is why I didn't tell anybody IRL. What do you mean IRL? Did you post about this somewhere? No, never mind. Just listen, L let me prove it to you. You said it yourself, the group is getting bigger every day, right? I'm good with numbers. They had 10 people yesterday, today it's 12. Chat and one other person. Tomorrow it'll be... 14, 15, who knows? 
Maybe they're not zombies per se, but it's definitely some sort of virus that's making them like this, and it's going to spread exponentially. 15 turns into 30, then 100, and pretty soon the whole town is infected. Could be the end of the whole world as we know it, unless we stop it. He paused and considered for a few long moments. One confused kid had stopped in the hallway outside the bathroom to stare at us. Uh, we're practicing a play. About zombies. I said as they moved on, looking dubious. Chris was looking at his feet, deep in thought. Nah, I don't buy it. Either you're messing with me or you totally lost it. Either way, I'm out until you tell me the truth. Chris walked away without another word, and just like that, my only friend in school was gone. I was all alone again with nowhere to go. I just stood in the hallway, feeling as if I was on a life raft all by myself, lost at sea. Jake? Jake Watson? A soft voice asked from just behind me. I turned around to see a stunningly beautiful red-haired girl wearing a cheerleader uniform. Immediately, I recognized her as Chet's girlfriend, Rachel. Several guys walking past turned their heads to stare at her, and I had a momentary glimpse at the ogling she probably went through on a daily basis, which I admittedly had taken part in. I overheard what you just said to your friend. I'm sorry for eavesdropping, but I was worried about Chet, and... Do do you really know what's wrong with him? Can you help me, please? I'm scared for him, and I don't know what to do. As I looked into her crystal blue eyes, I found myself saying, Yes. I'd do whatever she asked, I realized. I'd kill for this girl. My first week at Havenworth High was not going as expected. It was only my second day, and already I had witnessed... A bunch of goth kids murdering and cannibalizing a teen in the art room. Received attention. Lost my only friend. The only silver lining was that the prettiest girl in school, captain of the cheerleading squad, Rachel Dunn, was now standing in front of me asking for my help. I felt like I was in a dream. Also, simultaneously, a nightmare. So, can you help me? I know I'm asking a lot. You don't even know me. This is stupid. Sorry for bothering you. She said, turning away. I tried to call after her, but my voice was caught in my throat. She almost was around the corner before I finally managed to squeak out the words. Wait, I'll help you. She came back over to me and waited for me to say something else. I realized I was supposed to come up with a plan now. Do you have a phone with a camera on it? I asked. Yeah, of course. You don't? Uh, it's in the shop. I lied. Okay, so you get your camera ready to record a video, and I'll tell you when to turn it on. Okay? Look, this is going to be pretty gnarly. Are you sure you're ready for this? I'm ready, she said, taking out her iPhone. Okay, let's go. I took her over to the art room, and we stood outside the door. Okay, start recording. Let's get all this, I said, and she hit the red button. Pushing open the door, the two of us went inside. The art room was dark and empty during lunch hour, just as it had been the day prior. I listened for the sound of that noise coming from the room ahead to the right, from the kiln room. The sound of the art club feasting on a new inductee and enjoying their flesh and blood turning them into one of them. But there was nothing. I went up to the kiln room door and turned the knob. Inside, I saw the room was lined floor to ceiling with clear plastic tarps, just as it had been the day prior. But this plastic was clean unstained by blood spatter. The room hadn't been used yet. Which meant one thing. We were early. But not by much. 
The sounds of approaching footsteps and voices could be heard at the door just outside. Quick, hide! I whispered, and the two of us went over to a corner filled with large, half-completed sculptures. We both hid and held our breath as the door was pushed open and thirteen kids dressed in black clothing entered the art room. One of them was Chet Munster, and he had his arm around another kid who was wearing a letterman jacket. What's Dave doing here? Rachel whispered. That's Chet's best friend. But I thought he was mad at him after what happened earlier. Dave looked to be in a trance, and I noticed that one of the goth kids was walking backwards and looked like he was maintaining constant eye contact with him as they led him towards the kiln room. We have to do something, I said quietly. They're going to kill him. Even if he's going to come back to life afterwards, it still seems kind of wrong. We are doing something. Rachel said, holding up her phone for me to see. She was still recording. I nodded and let out a deep breath, trying to remain as quiet as I could as they led Dave into the side room. Once they were all inside, they shut the door behind them. Let's go see the principal. Maybe with the two of us in this video, it'll be enough to convince them to come check it out. Maybe we can catch them in the act. The two of us ran into the room and up the hall towards the principal's office and immediately ran into Mr. Mulholland. It was unclear whether he'd seen us come out of the classroom or not. Slow down, you two. No running in the halls. And Mr. Watson, I expect to see you in class today. No repeats of yesterday's behavior. Yes, Mr. Mulholland, I said, gulping. If he had seen us come out of the class, our whole plan was doomed. But I was fairly certain he hadn't. Rachel and I burst into the principal's office, panting and breathless. The secretary stood up from her desk, where a half-eaten tuna fish sandwich sat. What on earth? What is all this about? We need to see the principal, the two of us shouted in unison. Mr. Flake came out of his office wiping his mouth with a napkin. He looked so calm. I really hoped that what I said next would rattle him out of that relaxed state. There's a kid getting killed in the kiln room, I yelled, hoping I hadn't made it too subtle. His jaw dropped, and he came around the counter, which divided the room. Show me, Mr. Watson. And this better not be some prank, or you'll be getting more than just a week's detention. More like a year. You too, Miss Dunn. Rachel gave me a look, as if judging me again for trustworthiness. But then she gave me a small nod, her eyes full of resolve. She was in this with me, too. Detention wasn't a good look for the captain of the cheerleading squad. She could even get kicked off the team if this went south. We ran ahead of Mr. Flake leading him back towards the art room. I felt panicked now, wondering if my instincts had been wrong. The principal walked instead of running, and I wanted to yell at him to hurry. But he just said he didn't want to start a panic, so he continued with his infuriating slow pace. Finally, we reached the door to the classroom, and I threw it open. There were sounds coming from the room ahead, just like before. This was happening again. It was happening again. We had to catch them this time, though. I grabbed the principal's sleeve and pulled him faster towards the door, turned the knob, and threw it open. Gotcha! I yelled, seeing the gruesome scene within the room, and confirming all of my suspicions. There was blood splattered on the plastic tarps covering the wall and ceiling. It was pooled on the floor in a large puddle, which spread almost to the door. And in the middle of it all was the kid in the letterman jacket we'd seen them leading into the room. Except, no. No, 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 no. It wasn't him. It was Chet Munster. And he was sitting up, smiling at us as we entered. 
the whole group of them turned to look at us and held the bloody knives in their hands looking innocent despite the grisly scene. That was when I saw one of them holding up an iPhone filming the whole thing. She hit a button on the screen and let out an exasperated sigh. Ugh, seriously? You ruined the shot. This took forever to get set up. Thanks a lot, new kid. Why are you interrupting, Principal Flake? We had your permission for this, remember? Our horror film project? We said it would get a little gory, and you told us that was fine as long as we censored the really bad stuff. The principal looked around the room at the blood and gore and the goth kids covered in it, and then looked me dead in the eye. Detention. For the rest of the year. You too, Miss Dunn. Find yourself some better friends. What are you doing hanging out with this kid anyways? He left, and the two of us stood in the doorway, all of our cards on the table now. We stared in the faces of the now 13 kids who we were up against. I realized that this had all been a carefully crafted ploy to make me show my hand. They lured me into the situation and made me think I was one step ahead, when really I was always two steps behind. Nice try, new kid, Chet said. You have to be quicker than that to beat us, though. The principal was long gone, and Rachel's face, which had momentarily looked uncertain, was now dead set again. She stared at him, and her eyes filled with tears as she started to speak. Chet? What happened to you? He turned to look at her, and I saw for the first time that his eyes had a vaguely reddish hue to them. It was barely noticeable, only when he turned to look at us in just the right light. Evolution, he replied, grinning with bloodstained teeth. Just like they told us about in biology class, Rachel. We're the next step. The next picture on the diagram after Homo sapiens. Don't you want to be part of the future? Not a Neanderthal who didn't keep up with the times. He held out his hand for her to take, and for a moment I thought she might actually do it. But then she gripped mine instead and pulled hard on it as she ran from the room, yanking my shoulder almost out of its socket as she took me with her. The last thing I saw on Chet's face was a look of anger, mixed with rage and jealousy like I'd never seen before. Apparently those parts of his humanity were still fully intact. Maybe even amplified. Once we were out in the hallway, Rachel insisted on getting further from the room until we were back outside the cafeteria again. In here. There's still some time left in the lunch break. We, we can figure out a plan. I followed her in and saw the big room was mostly empty except for a few outliers. Chris was sitting at a table by himself, eating a cupcake. He looked extremely lonely. I told Rachel that he could help, but that he might need some convincing. Hey man, can we talk for a minute? I asked, approaching him from the side. He turned to look and saw Rachel was with me. Raising his eyebrows with sudden curiosity, he motioned for us to sit. Hi, Rachel said to him, looking at me and waiting to see what I would do. Hey, he said back. So what's this about? You gonna try to mess with me again? You gonna try to convince me that there's zombies taking over the school? He wasn't messing with you, Rachel said. And they are taking over the school. Chet just told the two of us pretty much that's exactly what's happening. He's one of them. And they think that they're the next phase of human evolution. It looks like they have some sort of regenerative abilities, judging by what Jake said happened yesterday. Like Wolverine or, or Deadpool. 
this immediately got Chris's attention, especially the part about comic books. Wait, seriously? His face was unreadable for a few long moments, as he looked to be considering what we told him. Finally, he nodded. I guess the comic book references are what did it. Alright, I guess I owe you an apology, Jake. Sorry I didn't believe you, man. Apology accepted. I probably wouldn't have believed it either, to be honest. Not until I saw it with my own eyes. Mr. Flake didn't believe it either. He just gave us both detention for the rest of the year. Holy shit, you told Flake about this? Yeah, we were trying to catch them red-handed, but... <sighs> they were expecting it. They set it all up to look like a Halloween horror film project with fake blood and everything. They're not stupid, that's for sure. We're going to have to be more clever about it next time. The three of us sat around the cafeteria table trying to decide on a plan. But before we could, the bell rang, indicating the end of lunch break. We need to get together after school to figure this out, Rachel said. If that group really is getting bigger by the day, we need to stop them before this disease spreads to the rest of the town. Maybe we need to call the military or something. If we couldn't convince Mr. Flake, how are we going to convince them? We'll probably just end up in jail instead of in detention. Yeah, you're probably right. It all comes back to proof. We need to find some evidence first. Then we skip the principal and bring it straight to the cops. Or the CDC or the FBI or something. The three of us left the cafeteria. That night, we decided we would get together to come up with a plan. Whatever we were going to do, we had to do it fast. Being the new kid in school is tough. You don't know anybody. You can't find your classes without asking directions. And you're totally unaccustomed to the local school's nuanced social hierarchy. In the case of Havenworth High, zombies rank right at the top of the food chain. One week had passed since I'd witnessed the art club ruthlessly feasting on Chet Munster's innards, his chest split open like a cadaver on an autopsy table. Oh, and did I mention that he rose from the dead and came back to school the next day looking totally normal? Except he was now wearing all black and was a member of the goth slash zombie clique. They had made him into one of them, just like they had done to so many others. Today in the cafeteria, I saw that the goth group had expanded and was now occupying two full tables in one section of the cafeteria. Without even counting, I knew there were exactly 52 of them. Not only that, but six teachers Two school bus drivers, the principal's secretary, had recently been coming to school wearing black clothing as well. Their faces pale and hair dyed, or supernaturally altered, to a stark noir like raven feathers with white streaks. Facial piercings were becoming a common fashion accessory among students and teachers alike as had Rob Zombie and Marilyn Manson shirts, which served as a uniform to distinguish the growing horde from the uninitiated. How many today? Chris asked from across the table. I'd shared a lot with them over the past week, including my skill with numbers. Rachel was also now a trusted friend, and we'd recently picked up one more member for our ragtag group as well. 52. Six teachers, two bus drivers, and the secretary. That means 61 total. It's fair to assume the families are infected too. Neighbors and friends. We could be looking at well over 200 now, maybe more. You know how it is with these things. Every case we know of, there could be five more, maybe 10 or 20. We're just speculating, really. 
So uh, 200 is the low ball estimate, said Jasper, the AV club kid who was really into computers and building his own inventions. He was another outlier, so naturally we had recruited him after he overheard our conversation in the cafeteria one day. Unfortunately, it was probably too late already. How's your surveillance setup coming along, Jasper? He pushed his glasses up higher on his nose since they were slipping down. I could tell he didn't have good news for us. So far, not good. The walls surrounding the Kilden room are fire-reinforced, so I couldn't drill in to put a camera through. I'm getting the feeling those zombies are smarter than they look. Maybe they're not even zombies at all. Aren't zombies supposed to be brain-dead? There's no precedent for this, Chris said. Everything we know about these creatures we learn from television and movies... Which means it's all fake. We have to keep that in mind. Zombie is just a placeholder term for whatever evil kids are turning into. Right. I agreed. In that kiln room in the art class is their favorite spot for killing and converting people. If we can get in there somehow and get some proof, we could finally show it to the proper authorities and stop this before it gets too widespread. Rachel shook her head. We tried that, remember? It didn't work. We just wound up with a semester of detention and nothing else to show for it. She was right. I'd been serving after-school detention with her for the past week. And as much as I enjoyed her company, I'd much rather have spent time with her outside of a mildew-smelling classroom where we weren't allowed to talk. Not only that, but I was grounded since my parents found out I'd gotten into trouble with the principal for making up stories about other students. We were on thin ice with the principal, Mr. Flake, as well as the art teacher, Mr. Mulholland. If either one of them caught us spying, we'd be getting worse than detention. It could result in suspension or even expulsion. Havenworth High had a zero-tolerance policy when it came to bullying, And ironically, I had been lumped into the category of bully for trying to prevent a zombie apocalypse. They have to be converting people after school somewhere, too. Maybe we can follow them and get a recording of them at some other place that isn't so well protected, Chris suggested. Now that's an idea, Jasper agreed. The only problem is Rachel and I are still grounded. How am I going to get around my parents? Just sneak out after they go to bed, Chris suggested. Climb out your window or something. Haven't you ever done that before? They all looked at me as if I was as brainless as a zombie. Oh, yeah, right, sure. I do that all the time. I'll just sneak out after they're asleep, like usual. What about you, Rachel? Can you meet up with us for a zombie hunt? Hell yeah. She said, and the three of us nodded our agreement. We all set a time and place to meet, and Jasper told us he'd plant a GPS device on Mr. Mulholland's car so we could try to track him to whatever place they were using as a base of operations. They'd been doing less and less killing inside the school since we'd attempted to catch them mid-slaughter. They were being much more careful now. Looks like this is the base of operations, Jasper said as the four of us stood outside the building. The alley was dark and eerily quiet as we tried to find a place to sneak inside. Eventually we came across a door which had been propped open slightly. The sound of approaching footsteps could be heard coming from around the corner, so we all ducked inside, taking our chances while we could. Someone's coming, I whispered to Rachel as we entered the building. We have to find somewhere to hide, quick! Up here, Chris said in a low voice, pointing towards a rickety-looking staircase. He began to climb it, and I saw the thing swaying as he went upwards. I wanted to argue with him or go anywhere else, but up that terrifying set of steps. But then the sound of voices could be heard entering the building 
where we had just come in, and I realized that I had no choice. The rest of us followed him up the stairs as they swayed beneath our feet. The entire structure felt like it could collapse at any second. As I heard the voices entering the room we'd just been in, I slipped, scraping my shin against the wood of the stairs and making a loud bang. Yeah, what the hell was that? I heard one of them ask. Are those stairs moving? Nah, nobody's crazy enough to climb up there. I think it's a death trap, it's probably just the wind. I heard the man approaching nonetheless and hurried up the stairs so I wouldn't be seen. On the second floor of the old warehouse building, we found a lot of old water-damaged junk and boxes, torn apart by age and rodents. The four of us stepped carefully across the wooden floorboards, terrified of falling through the rotten planks. Chris was up ahead, pointing down through a hole in the floor. There was a look on his face that was strangely triumphant. I told you not to eat the tuna, Jake. What did I tell you? He stepped back so I could see, and I looked down at what was happening below. The goth zombie kids were in an assembly line making tuna fish sandwiches for the school cafeteria. Principal Flake and Mr. Mulholland were marching around like factory supervisors, making sure they were all working at a satisfactory pace. And most terrifying of all was the source of the tuna fish, laid out on a steel table. A fresh teenager they had just picked up from somewhere by the looks of it. They had all eaten their fill of his flesh, and were now packaging his tainted meat into sandwiches to infect anyone who ate it. No wonder the teacher's assistant had switched over, and so many teachers always ate the tuna sandwiches at lunch. Rachel pulled out her phone and began to record. We got him this time, she said grimly. They're not going to get away with this anymore. After a few minutes of her recording every angle she could manage from the vantage point we had, she turned the phone off and nodded to the three of us. Okay, we got it. Let's get out of here. It should be enough to prove our case to any cops. Maybe even the FBI if we have to go over their heads. The four of us got up to our feet and began to walk across the creaking, rotten floorboards of the second story. As we neared the center of the room, I heard a sickening crack as the rotting wood beneath my feet gave way. I fell through the hole in the floor, and my three companions came with me as it yawned open wider from my girth passing through. I fell on a stack of boxes at the center of the room, which would have been a good thing had they not been filled with tin cans. My back ached horribly as I rolled down to the ground and collapsed in a heap. Rachel didn't fare much better as I heard her crying out in pain. Mr. Mulholland was standing over me when I looked up, and my heart began to hammer with fear as he pulled me up to my feet. Look, class, he said, smiling and baring his teeth. It's fresh meat. Hey, everybody. My name is Jake Watson, and I need your help. My school, Havenworth High, is in an outbreak. Not your traditional outbreak like you hear about on the news. No... This is a full-blown zombie plague, spreading throughout the school population. It started with a few students in the goth clique, who I thought were just a bit stinky and pale at first. But then I stumbled onto their kill room slash pottery kiln room and watched as they ripped the would-be prom king to shreds in the art room at lunch hour a couple weeks back. The next day, he returned to school as a reanimated goth, and his girlfriend, Rachel, came to me for help. 
Sorry, this is probably a lot to take in, especially if it's your first time visiting Havenworth High. I'll try to take it slow, but a lot has happened. And there's a lot of work to be done if we're going to stop the zombie apocalypse. A week ago, we started trying to stop them in earnest, realizing it was up to the four of us to prevent this shit from spreading. But even by that point, I should have known we couldn't deal with it ourselves. By then, there were nearly 60 students, teachers, and staff members infected. But these things are always more widespread than they appear on the surface. For every one we knew about, there could be 10 or 20 more cases. By this time next week, my three friends and I might be the only ones left alive in Havenworth. Last week, the four of us tracked the goth zombie kids to their hideout and found out the principal was involved as well. Not just involved, he was intentionally spreading the plague by serving tainted tuna fish sandwiches to the school. In reality, it was actually ground-up flesh from infected victims, mixed with mayonnaise, celery, dill, pickle, and salt and pepper for seasoning. Rachel managed to get some video evidence on her phone through a gap in the floorboards as we hid on the second floor of the dilapidated warehouse. My new friends, Jasper and Chris, were with us too, and we were just about to take our evidence to the police when the rotten wooden floor collapsed beneath us and we fell through, landing right in the middle of the zombie assembly line where they were making the tainted tuna sandwiches. It's always a little awkward when you get caught spying, especially when murder and cannibalism are involved. Look, class, fresh meat, Mr. Mulholland said grinning with blood-stained teeth and pulling me up by my shirt collar. I was terrified, kicking my legs as I was held up in the air by the unnaturally strong zombie teacher. The goth kids all started making their way towards us, and I realized we only had a few seconds to escape before we'd be totally screwed. I tried to punch him and kick him, but it was like hitting a brick wall. It didn't affect him in the slightest. That's when I remembered something. My parents had taken me to the beach the day before, and I was still wearing the same shorts. They hadn't been washed yet. Pocket sand! I yelled, grasping a palmful of the stuff and tossing it into Mr. Mulholland's eyeballs. He released me, screaming and rubbing his eyes vigorously. Run! I shouted to the others. The four of us climbed out from the boxes of cans we landed on and tried to make a break for the exit. Unfortunately, the school principal, Mr. Flake, was standing there waiting for us, blocking our path. Oh, you're in deep trouble, Mr. Watson, he said with an evil grin. There's no way out except through me. Now enough of this foolishness. Join us. You'll see. There's nothing else in the world like this feeling. You'll love being immortal. You'll love being part of something more. I picked up something heavy nearby. I I, I think it might have been a femur. And threw it at him, but missed terribly. Uh, Have it your way, he said and began to move towards me. The principal got close and I tried to duck away from him, but he was too quick. He grabbed hold of me and then had a grip around my arm like a vice. He started pulling me towards the table where the bloody cadaver of another student lay. His sternum and rib cage split open and emptied out. Rachel surprised us both by jumping up on his back from behind and started to strangle him with what looked like a very well-practiced rear naked choke. Her right arm was tight beneath his neck and squeezing, using her left bicep for leverage. Principal Flake's face started to turn red, then blue, then finally purple as the three of us began to hurry past him towards the exit. I tried to grab Rachel as the zombie kids got closer to us. Their red-tinged eyes reminded me of old Polaroid photos that hadn't developed right. Their skin was sallow and pale gray. They growled in a collective baritone. 
Rachel was pulling away from me, and I realized she wanted to kill Mr. Flake. Or at least ensure that he was unconscious. Her face was determined and angry as she turned to look at me, gritting her teeth. Just go, she said, and I realized she was using all of her focus to keep choking the thrashing, impossibly strong zombie principal. Run! If you don't, they'll kill us all! Chris grabbed my arm and Jasper was screaming at me to run, and before I knew it, we were out on the street again, fleeing on foot. But Rachel wasn't with us. I felt like a complete coward. The three of us were exhausted and out of breath by the time we got back to the park near my house where we stopped to rest and regroup. Our eyes were shifting from side to side as we looked at every shadow suspiciously, unsure where a zombie might pop out from. Shit, Chris whispered. Rachel had the phone with the recording on it. That was our proof. Man, who cares about that now? She's one of them. We're screwed. We're never going to stop the zombie plague from taking over town. Jasper was more out of breath than either one of us, but he managed to catch his wind enough to say something. Not necessarily, he wheezed, his hands on his knees. What do you mean, Jasper? How are we going to stop them? There's too many of them. We've got nothing now. No proof. Nothing to show the cops. After panting for a few more long seconds, he pushed his glasses up higher on his nose and pulled something out from his pocket. A smushed, cellophane-wrapped sandwich. I managed to get this from the warehouse, he said with a devious grin. All we have to do is get this baby tested at a lab, and we can prove it's made of people meat. Chris and I looked at him and realized for the first time that maybe he wasn't as much of a genius as we thought. At least not in every aspect of life. Uh, Jasper, I appreciate the help. But you know those are readily available in the school cafeteria, right? That's the whole problem? He held up the sandwich and looked at it in the moonlight. Well, yeah. There was a long moment of awkward silence between the three of us. So much for that idea, he said, throwing it over his shoulder. I ran over and picked it up. Man, some kid could eat that. We might as well bring this one to the lab rather than buy one and raise suspicion. Do you guys know a good place where we can get this tested around here? Chris grabbed the sandwich from my hands. My aunt works at the lab. I'll give it to her and, and make up some story about how I'm doing a project for school and want to find out how much dolphin there is in canned tuna, but also how much human meat. Maybe she'll buy that. The three of us parted ways with his bizarre plan in mind. It was pretty much the only option at that point. If we went to the police with nothing, they'd just laugh us out of the precinct. So we had no choice but to go on with our lives until the test results came back. The next week at school was tough. I'm not going to lie. Rachel was back to sitting in the cheerleader slash jock slash goth slash zombie section of the cafeteria, which had also grown to include the skater kids, the metal kids, and the hip-hop kids. Not to mention the stoners, who were rarely seen past 12 p.m. on most days, and tended to not attend afternoon classes or lunch hour. The mob of teens in dark clothing was almost a quarter of the cafeteria now. Chris, Jasper, and I were on our own watching the mass of zombies grow larger. Instead of his usual ravenous appetite, Chris didn't look hungry. As he picked at his pizza, pulling the pepperoni off and wrapping them up in a napkin as if he didn't want to look at the meat. He sniffed his chocolate milk suspiciously, barely touched his cupcake. He appeared to have lost weight since we'd stumbled on the zombie operation. It was the first time he'd seen the bloody business for himself, I realized, and it had shaken him badly. The last week had been hell for all of us. Why are they even keeping us alive? Chris asked suddenly. It doesn't make sense. They could just kill us right now and turn us. Nobody would say a word. I think we're the only ones left. 
Jasper pointed up at the security cameras in the corners of the large room. Well, maybe somebody's watching who they don't want to see. Or could be they're just toying with us. It's hard to make sense of it, though. Have you heard anything from the lab yet? I can't believe it's taking them this long to figure out if a tuna fish sandwich has any human meat in it. Nothing yet, Chris said, shaking his head. Any day now, though. Maybe they would at least convince the police to come over here and check out the situation. Test the frickin' sandwiches for themselves. Chris's cell phone began to ring suddenly. He pulled it out from his pocket and looked at the caller ID. Hey, speak of the devil. It's the lab. He hit the green button and put the phone up to his ear. Hello? Jasper and I waited in tense silence as Chris's face went from hopeful to sullen disquiet. Yes? Uh Uh-huh. Wait. Are you sure? No. No, that can't be right. Look, I, I know it was an odd request, but there is a specific reason for... Hello? He looked at the phone again and saw it was disconnected now. My aunt wasn't working, and she's off sick today, apparently. But that lady said the tuna sandwich contained tuna, celery, mayonnaise, pickle, salt, and pepper. No dolphin, no human flesh. Must be an ethical brand. We sat silently, unsure of what to say or how to move on from this. Either the lab was in cahoots with the zombies, or we'd been wrong somehow about the vector of infection. Either one seemed possible, but I suspected it was the former rather than the latter. If a quarter of the school was infected, then a quarter of the town could be as well. And that included the folks in the lab. Do you think the lab people are in on it? Chris asked as if reading my mind. (sighs) We don't know who could be infected at this point. It's getting more and more likely that everyone we see in town is a potential carrier. I have to be on the lookout for red-tinted eyes. That's our only clue right now. We're running out of options here. Pretty soon it's inevitable that the three of us are going to get turned into zombies at this rate. Well, what we're doing isn't working. we got to change tactics, Chris said. Maybe we just need to call the military and see what they say. Maybe they've got some reports already and, and our three eyewitness statements will be enough to get them to take some action. I had to admit, it seemed like a better idea than anything I could come up with at that moment. Alright, I guess it's worth a shot. (laughs) You have the phone number for the nearest military base, I guess? Chris spent a minute looking on his phone using Google, then eventually came up with a phone number. Found it, he said, pressing the send button. Okay, it's ringing. Just as he was opening his mouth to say hello... The overhead PA crackled to life. Jake Watson. Chris Fleming. Jasper Wilmington. To the principal's office immediately. The three of us sat silently and Chris looked at his phone with surprised eyes. Shit, they hung up. Call back. This might be our last chance. We're heading into the belly of the beast. I said to Chris and he put the phone to his ear again. Hello? I'd like to report a... Well, I'd like to report a zombie outbreak at my school. Havenworth High, he said into the receiver. Yes, I know how that sounds. But you have to believe me, I have other eyewitnesses. Two of them. Yes, they're freshmen. No, we weren't put up to this by older kids. No, I'm not yelling. You're yelling. Okay, goodbye. Okay, goodbye. He put the phone back in his pocket. Yep, we're screwed. Okay, let's go to the principal's office. The three of us exited the cafeteria and began walking back down the hall towards the main office. Once we arrived there, we expected to be turned into zombies and have to live the rest of our days as brainless, undead acolytes. Well, it was nice being friends with you guys for a couple weeks at least, I said as we walked down the hallway together one last time. I really suck at making new friends, so thanks for making it easy for me. You're both really... 
I suddenly realized I was alone. Looking around, I saw no indication of Chris or Jasper in the hallway with me, even though they had just been there a second before. It was like I just imagined them the whole time, and I'd really been alone since the beginning of my time at Havenworth High. I was back to being all by myself again, and I hated it. The principal's office was calling my name, literally, over the PA system again, so I picked up my pace and kept walking. Then I heard the sound of footsteps behind me. Looking back, I saw several large goth kids were pursuing me, moving through the halls with a look of purpose in their eyes. Ah, shit, I muttered, starting to run. If I was going to go down, it wouldn't be without a fight. I turned a corner and ducked into a locker, which I noticed was unused. Closing the door behind me, I waited inside for the zombies to run past. As I held my breath, I heard them slow down outside the door and stop. He's here somewhere. I can smell him, one of them said. I saw them beginning to backtrack, looking around for places where I could have hidden. There weren't many options. He's in one of the lockers. They started ripping them open one by one, the locks snapping in half as they yanked the steel doors with inhuman strength. My heart was pounding in my chest, and I knew, as they came closer and closer, that I was doomed. This was it for me. I was going to be turned into a zombie, whether I liked it or not. I was trapped inside a dark locker, trying not to breathe, as the zombies drew closer to me on all sides. This hallway of Havenworth High was abandoned, except for the undead goths who had been chasing me, wanting me to turn me into one of them like they had to so many others. Jake Watson, to the principal's office. The overhead PA announced again. The principal of the school was the one running this whole mess, we found out. And that was the last place I wanted to go. I was trapped between a rock and a hard place. My friends had gone missing. And now I was alone in my fight against this ungodly plague. It was only a matter of time before the inevitable happened, and I became just another brain-dead, stinking zombie. My hand reached up to push the locker open, thinking I might as well just give myself up. When suddenly the wall behind me opened, and I stumbled backwards. Someone grabbed my arm and pulled me into the shadows, just as I heard the locker door swing open. Hmm. Nobody here. That's weird. I thought I heard something. The muffled voices said from above. The sounds receded into the distance as I was pulled deeper and deeper into the darkness beneath my high school down concrete steps until we were in a cool space, deep below the ground. Once down there, the face of the person who just saved me came into focus in the dim glow of their flashlight. His familiar bearded face and blue eyes were immediately recognizable. Dad? Quiet, he said, putting his finger up to his lips. They might hear you. He waved me onward, and I followed after him, stuttering and mumbling and totally unsure of what exactly I was trying to ask him. How? What? Why are you down here? Come on, he whispered. I'll show you everything. Just keep your voice down. After a long while of walking underground, we came to a surveillance office. There were two other men and a woman down there watching video feeds, which were displayed on monitors around the room. They showed every angle of Havenworth High. What is all this? I asked, dumbfounded. This is your high school, my dad told me. And 
Things aren't looking so good at the moment. I think we might have lost another one. What do you mean by that? He looked at the other three people, then asked if we could have the room to ourselves for a minute. They left reluctantly, and when they did, I saw they were all wearing navy blue jumpsuits that looked vaguely military. There was a simple crest on each shoulder, but no other markings. My dad had no uniform, though. He was in plain clothes, wearing a black leather jacket. Son, have you ever wondered about my job? The reason why we're moving around all the time? You told me you're a computer repair technician. But I'm starting to guess that isn't really the truth. I'm sorry to say I've been lying to you for a long time, son. I've never gotten the chance to share any of this information with you up until now. Never had the clearance to. I work for a government agency. We investigate paranormal events. I can't tell you more than that. I felt as if the floor had dropped out from beneath my feet and I was falling suddenly. I realized I wasn't breathing and gasped in some air just as the world was starting to go black around the edges. Calm down, I told myself. You've been through a lot more than this recently. And it does make sense in a way. All this time, we were we were trying so hard to find evidence. To find proof and figure out who to tell about what was happening. And this whole time, you're the person I could have told from the start. And you would have believed me. He nodded. Yeah. You really should be more honest with your old man. I could have helped you much sooner. So let me get this straight. You moved us here so you could investigate Havenworth High. But then you had me go to school here, too? Even though there were zombies? He looked a little sheepish for a moment, mumbling something about insufficient evidence and how highly improbable such a thing had seemed. I was starting to become furious. Listen, the reports were laughable, to be honest, Jake. My boss told me it would be a nice vacation for us for a while. A chance to settle down, have a real life for a few years. I wanted to move here for you. None of us at the agency thought it was really true, but now it's becoming impossible to deny. There there really is a zombie plague infecting the kids at Havenworth High, and now it's spread to the rest of Havenworth, despite our best efforts. I need to get you out of here. It's becoming too dangerous. No shit. I almost got killed like three times. Last week I snuck out of my room to track him down and we almost got eaten. And now one of my kids is a zombie and two are missing? He looked at me sternly. You were supposed to be grounded, mister. You snuck out without our permission? Yes! Didn't you hear what I just said? The other three people in blue jumpsuits came in suddenly looking worried. We got a situation, sir. They found the secret entrance behind the locker. We need to evacuate. ASAP. Shit. My dad muttered. Alright. Time to call it a day. Let's pack it up, people. He opened up a hatch in the ceiling and a rope ladder came down from above. Then he pulled a walkie-talkie from his belt and said something into it. Eagle One, we're gonna need a ride home from school today. What's your twenty? The sound of static crackled back, and then a familiar voice began to speak. Coming in hot, Major. I'll be there in five minutes for evac. We don't have five, Eagle One. Make it three if you can. And we're going to need containment. Roger that, Major. That's a go on containment. The caution tape is being unfurled as we speak. Roger, Eagle One. See you soon. With that, my dad clipped the radio back onto his belt and nodded at me. Okay, son. Time to get out of Havenworth before we get eaten alive. He didn't have to tell me twice. I began climbing up the rope ladder as quickly as I could, and when I got to the top I saw we were on the roof of the school. There was a strange, monotonous moaning sound coming from below, 
and a skunky smell coming from the smoking section outside the school. Walking over to the edge, I looked down and saw a bunch of the stoner kids were out there smoking weed, despite the fact that they were zombies. I guess old habits die hard. But the biggest problem was they were finishing up their session. And they were getting the munchies. One of them saw me on the roof and pointed. Mmm, snack-sized freshman, he said, moving towards a nearby utility ladder. He started climbing up and several others followed after him. The other three people in blue jumpsuits were coming up from the hatch and then my dad came up behind them. He had a worried look on his face and I heard others following after him. We've got a situation, we both said at the same time. I pointed over my shoulder and he told the other three people to watch the hatch and to make sure nobody got up to the roof. Within a few moments, there were zombies coming up from two different directions. The rope ladder we just used to climb up to the roof, and the utility ladder which led down to the smoking section. My dad was fighting off the stoner zombie group with my help, while his associates fought off the other group, kicking at the angry undead teens with their boots and trying to slam the hatch closed. The rope ladder would have been easy to cut loose with a knife, Except there were too many of them, and they were too fast and too strong to fend off. There's too many of them, one of the soldiers was yelling. When's the chopper going to get here? Go over there and help them, my dad told me. Get that hatch closed. I ran over and tried to push the steel door closed with all of my weight. But the zombies were holding strong, unflinching, as I slammed it down on their heads repeatedly. The other three people were kicking the zombies in their faces and grunting with effort as they tried to knock them back down the ladder, just like I had when I had fought Mr. Flake in the abandoned warehouse. It was like hitting a brick wall. There was a scream from the other side of the roof, and I looked to see my dad had two red-eyed zombie stoner kids on him, grappling with him and trying desperately to pull him over the side of the building. His eyes were wide and terrified as I ran over to him. But it was too late. One of them was already ripping a piece from his neck with his teeth. While the other was feasting on his cheek. Pulling off the skin, the stretching strand. They wrestled with him and he tried to fight them off. Valiantly twisting and thrashing until he went hurtling off the side of the building. The whole tangled group of zombies went down with them, and they fell with a loud impact onto the pavement below. I was too terrified to look down, but the sounds I heard of them feeding were enough to know what had happened. I heard his screams cut short a few moments after they'd begun and realized my dad was a goner. He was one of them now. Grab the kid! Someone nearby was yelling and I felt someone grab me around the waist as the rooftop was suddenly crowded with undead zombies. The sound of the helicopter above was loud, but I didn't even notice it with all that was happening. All that I had just witnessed. They pulled me up into the chopper and I looked to see my mom was flying it. I took this in with a dull sense of dreamlike wonderment. He's gone, I said despondently. Dad, the zombies, they killed him. So sorry, Jake, my mom said as we got further away. We'll get him back. Somehow we'll get him back. But we didn't get him back. As you might have guessed. As we flew away from the school, I knew he was lost forever, just like my friends. I took one last look down and saw Chris... Jasper, and Rachel, among a big group of other kids. 
I felt a pang of regret for the high school experiences I might have had, if not for the mess we'd stumbled upon. My old friends were all pale-faced and black-haired now. They were no longer outliers or lone wolves. The three of them and all the other cliques were moving together as one group now, like a pack of wolves. And they were turning homicidal on every other living person in the school and outside. They were attacking a postman on the street, stopping cars and pulling out the passengers through smashed windows. It was a bloodbath down there, as if the tide had just turned. And they'd gotten out just in time. There was a military convoy circling the town, as I noticed as we ascended higher. The horrifying details became lost in the distance, but I imagined a detour being set up at all major thoroughfares and highways that went through town. I imagined a government cover-up unlike anything I'd ever thought possible, making the town of Havenworth vanish from the face of the earth, as if it had never existed in the first place. Stories would be constructed... Lies fabricated, evidence falsified. Deaths would be faked and dental records would be forged. Just like in the movies, they'd erase the whole event and make it seem like a bad dream. And that sounded fine to me. We're in a new town now. I'm the new kid in school again and it's... It's like the same old movie on repeat, playing on a loop. I know I should try to make new friends. It's hard to want to anymore, especially after all that's happened, and besides, we're just going to move again. What's the point? My mom promised me we're staying for a while. She said this town is normal. She said that we're taking a break from the agency for a while. (laughs) Who knows, maybe she's actually telling the truth this time. Maybe I should try to make some new friends after all. A kid was nice to me on the first day of class. He reminded me a little bit of Chris. (laughs) He was wearing a Metallica shirt. And he was skinny and pale, but at the same time, he was also very hairy. His arms, chest, and face were covered in what looked like fur. He looked over to me across the aisle in English class and spoke in a gruff voice that sounded too deep for someone his age. Hey, my name is Lucius. What's yours? Jake, I told him. Jake Watson. Right on. Welcome to Lunamort High, Jake. If you need help finding your classes, let me know. I'm happy to help out. Thanks, I said back quietly, trying to keep my voice down as the teacher looked our way. It's nice to meet you. You too, Jake. I got a feeling about you, man. You're a lone wolf, just like me. Aren't you? 